Well, first of all, before I get into my talk again, I have to give a couple of shout outs. First of all, to my mommy. Hi, mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I know you're going to watch this talk in a few days, and I'll call you later, I promise. Make sure you call your moms, all right? Today of all days. Okay, next. Today, you know, Mother's Day, you know how when you have a birthday or something right around a holiday, you kind of feel like you have to share? Well, unfortunately, my wife uh, is subject to that. So if you'll show that cute, oh, cute picture. Today happens to be my son Caleb's second birthday. He's two years old today. Look how cute he is. You know? And then tomorrow is Nicole's birthday, and I won't tell you how old she is. She, <laughs> she's at one year younger than me. Okay. All right, so uh, that's my family, and because I'm on stage and have the microphone, I can do that. <laughs> okay, 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 moving on. With today being Mother's Day, oh, I don't have a clock, so you guys are going to be here a while. <laughs> today being Mother's Day, I thought it appropriate to talk about probably the most famous mother to have ever lived, especially in the past 2,000 years, and I am talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course. A lot of attention has been paid to Mary through the years, and understandably so. I mean, she is the only woman that we know of to become pregnant without uh, the male part of the reproductive cycle participating, test tube or not. And of course, her son went on to become the most famous person in history. So mom of the most famous person in history makes sense that we kind of look at her as something special. In fact, we, we tend to think of her as something very uniquely special about her, and understandably so. In fact, there are many beliefs or myths that have arisen through the years, and if you remember a few weeks ago, I did a, a talk about the Middle Ages of Christianity, uh, the, the, the starting what used to be the Catholic Church, meaning just the universal church, and then we split in the Reformation. But then before, before all that happened, we had certain doctrines, certain beliefs, uh, certain myths that started to arise about this person, Mary. And I'm going to explain a few of them here today. The first is the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception. Oftentimes, especially for us Protestants, we confuse this as meaning uh, the conception, meaning the conception of a, of a child in the womb. That's what that's referring to. We, we assume that means they're talking about Jesus, but the fact is the Immaculate Conception is referring to Mary being conceived sinlessly in the womb of her parents, being born sinless, and then, then living a sinless life. This was how it is that Jesus was able to be born sinless. And remember, if you remember from a few weeks ago, one of the things you'll notice that I do is I reference my other talks, which means I expect you to listen and remember them. Just saying, you can download my notes. Um, so one of the things about the Middle Ages when this started coming about is that they had a very strong sense of the physical, of the, uh, of the they, they didn't quite have that separation between uh, either the physical and the spiritual, and they have a, had a very uh, focus on sin. So they also believed that uh, it, it, that it was passed on physically through the genes, through the however it is babies were born process. And so they're like, how could Jesus have been born sinless if his mom was sinful like the rest of us? And so they answered that question by saying that Mary must have been born sinless instead of thinking, well, Jesus' birth was a miracle, so perhaps the sinless part was thrown in for free. So either way, this can be found nowhere in Scripture. Another uh, myth about Mary is the idea of the perpetual virginity. Uh, thrown into the last one, this idea of perpetual sinlessness, a sinless life forever. Perpetual virginity is the idea that Mary was literally a virgin her entire life, which, of course, it talks about her having, or uh, Jesus having brothers and sisters, and I doubt Joseph would have stayed with her that long if uh, that were true. Uh, another one is the bodily assumption. The bodily assumption, this is the idea that Mary... Uh, oftentimes this is confused into thinking she was like scooped up into heaven like uh, Elijah was, but uh, I've read up on this, and it's not that she that happened. She lived a sinless life, perpetual virginity, so when she died, like Jesus, she was resurrected, had a glorified body, and then ascended into heaven just like Jesus. So that's another thing. This, these are all official doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Now you can look this stuff up on Google. Uh, and it's also believed by many uh, that while Jesus may sit at the right hand of the Father, Mary sits on the other side, and since he's a good boy, he listens to his mommy, and so if you ask her to tell him things, then he'll listen. This is why she's also referred to as the Queen of Heaven 
and the mother of God. Again, I'm not trying to bash the Roman Catholic Church. These are official doctrines. They were developed in the Middle Ages before the Reformation, so this is our history as well. You can look all this up on Google, but you can't find it anywhere in the Bible. So the big question that has to be asked to those of us who are not raised this way, and these are like fantastical, what are you talking about kind of ideas, is why? Why, why make up all this stuff about Mary? I mean, granted, she is the mother of Jesus, and you know she, she did have to see her son die on a cross, um, but why the extreme veneration? Why, why the practical worship, the, the deification? Why make her almost equal with Jesus? Well, I have a theory of why that is. Now, as I said a minute ago, if you remember from a a few weeks ago, I talked about the Middle Ages, about how they had a strong focus on the physical, uh, and they were very, very, very focused on sin. Uh, they tried their best to get rid of it and, and do what they could to get, get away from it and take care of it through baptism, penance, and purgatory, and all these things. And they also believed that basically, unless you're without sin, if you've angered God in any way, he's not going to bless you. If, you, if, you, if you've angered God in any way, if you, you have sin in your life, he's not going to bless you. So with that thinking, you have to think about, all right, who's the person in history who probably had the most favor from God? Well, it was Mary, because she got to birth the sinless Christ. So let's look at her and think about what was it about her that was so special that she got this awesome favor from God? Because I know I can't get it, and I know you can't get it, because we all mess up, and we all are so sinful. But let's look at her, and honor her, and, and see what she's done. She's like an example to us of a human being who earned God's grace. Which, if you remember, grace cannot be earned. So we read this story, which we'll do in a minute. There's not much to go on, so we think about it some more. I'm trying to remember, you're in the mindset of people back then. You're in the the mindset. So we think about it some more, and we determine that she must have been without sin. In order to birth the sinless Christ, in order to have such great favor from God, she must have been sinless herself. I mean, how could God use someone sinful to do something so awesome? Uh, And we'll use a little bit of deductive reasoning. We know that God doesn't reward sinners, and he greatly rewarded Mary, so she must not have been a sinner. And if she wasn't a sinner, that means we must have, she must have never had Sex, because that's just bad, and why else do priests not do it? And that means that she had to be a virgin in her entire life. So those brothers and sisters were really just cousins, and Joseph was just a very understanding guy. And someone so awesome as Mary couldn't have just died like the rest of us. She was sinless like Jesus, so she must have gotten the same treatment that he did. And since she's his mom, and since he's perfect and always obeys his mommy and daddy, then he must still do what it is that she says. And so there you have, it's all reasonable. It all kind of makes sense if you start with the assumption that grace is something you can earn. But that's just it. Is our human reasoning can be very flawed, especially when we start with a wrong assumption. And when grace is something that you can earn, then we have to look at how did this person earn such grace and start applying that to. So one way or another, you know, some of us believe this, some of us do not. You know, it, it raised through the years. And but why is it a problem? I mean, does it really matter? Does it matter to you and me as Protestants? We don't practice that particular flavor of the Christian religion. Why does it matter to us this idea of giving Mary such honor and such deification and veneration? I mean. Uh, why do we put her on a pedestal? I mean, she did give birth to Jesus, so she probably should get some kind of honor. But why is it a problem that we take it this far? And the problem I see is, despite the obvious idolatry and the obvious distraction from Jesus himself, I think that making Mary something more than an ordinary girl can cause the rest of us to believe something that is not true about ourselves. And it can be devastating. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But first, let's go ahead and look at what is actually in the Bible about Mary and the birth of Jesus. We find the story in Luke chapter 1. Follow me on the screen. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's Mary's cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name 
was Mary. Now, Mary was probably about 13 or 14 years old, which was the common age for girls at that time to be betrothed. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Now after this, Mary goes on to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. Uh, and, you know, the John jumps in the womb, you know, that story. And then she goes on to recite this thing that's come to be known as Mary's Song or the Magnificat, which uh, is, comes from the Latin version of the first word, which I'm not going to go into here today. And the next thing we see is that she's having the baby in a barn, and they lay him in the, the manger or the feeding trough. Other than this narrative about Jesus' birth, there's really not that many references to Mary uh, in the Bible. And she disappears after the narrative in Acts chapter 1. While Jesus was around, he didn't really treat her with any special honor, and though he did command John when he was on the cross to take care after his mom. So let's take a closer look at this part and see what it is we can see. Let's look back at verse 28 and 29, the, verse, the first interchange between Mary and the angel Gabriel. It says, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Can you imagine an angel speaking to you? (laughs) I mean, it must have been quite a frightful thing because pretty much every time an angel appears to someone, the first thing they have to say is, don't be afraid. Fear not. They must have been quite frightful creatures. They probably weren't the little cherubs we see around Valentine's Day. Uh, They're probably pretty frightening. So she comes to Mary, who's a young girl, who's pretty much as common as common can be. The fact that her soon-to-be husband is a carpenter indicates that she's not royalty. She's not something, uh, you know, on a pedestal. She's just an ordinary, common person about to marry a carpenter. And this powerful being shows up and tells Mary that she is highly favored. She's troubled at his words. She wonders, why would he say such a thing about her? Clearly, she was not expecting this, much less to even from an angel. And in this culture back in those days, men pretty much didn't even talk to women. They didn't greet a woman in the street. Hey, how you doing? You know what? You're looking good today. That's a nice dress you have on. They didn't do that. Women were second-class citizens, practically property. So the fact that a man, because the angel Gabriel you know, had the appearance at least of a man, and not only that, but an angel came and said to this person who pretty much no one ever speaks to, who blends into the background, look, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And so she was troubled. And uh, she, she didn't really know what to say. And then she goes on to tell her, or he goes on to tell her the unbelievable, that you're going to give birth to the Son of God. The Son of God. Now, she's a Jew, and so back, you know, the, the Jewish faith, they know God, Yahweh. He parted the Red Sea, brought him out of Egypt, and they can recite the whole story. And, she, and, he, and the angel's saying, look, you're going to have that God's son. Imagine her confusion. First, the angel's even talking to her. And then he's saying, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then he says, you're going to have the Son of God. And probably the only thing that she can even come up with in her head is like, but I'm still a virgin. How's that going to happen? And then the angel responds in verse 35. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I mean, what a promise. He understands her confusion. He understands her fear, her not understanding what he's talking about. So he makes this promise about you're going to have the Son of God, and just back it up. Look, your cousin, who was really old, if you read in the first chapter of Luke, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're very, very old. He goes, he can't speak anymore because he doubts what the angel says. Well, anyway, she was like 
too old to have babies, and she got pregnant anyway. And the angel's like, look, that was impossible, and that's happening. So this is possible, too, because no word from God will ever fail. And I want to say something. I want to go on a little side note here about this particular verse, verse 37. For no word from God will ever fail. The Greek in this verse is a little bit tricky, uh, which is why often you times you see it say either a word from God or just nothing with God is impossible. In fact, if we look at a few of the translations in the New International Version, it says, for no word from God will ever fail. The New Living Translation says, for nothing is impossible with God. The NET, the New English Translation, says, for nothing will be impossible with God. The World English Bible says, for everything spoken by God is possible. The American Standard Version says, for no word from God shall be void of power. While each verse uh, denotes the same basic meaning, you'll notice that sometimes it refers to word and sometimes it refers to things, and that's because the Greek word used here is rhema, R-H-E-M-A, the English transliteration is rhema, which most of the time is translated word or the word of God. So it seems that the American Standard Version could be the more accurate saying, no word from God shall be void of power. No word from God is without power. We say empty words all the time, but no word from God is without power. That means when you pick this book up, when you read the things that are in it, we call this the word of God. We believe, as uh, in 2 Timothy refers to, that all scripture is God-breathed, that he made this. These are the words of God, which is why it's an active and living, sharper than any double-edged sword. This is why James says, if you read it and do what it says, you will be blessed because there is literal God's power in these very words. And that, my friends, is why sometimes it's hard to read. It's like trying to drink from a fire hose. It's hard to ingest power. And God's power is in his words. And when you read it, it cuts you and it changes you. So don't, don't neglect God's word. It has power in it and it will give you power. Okay. So back to the story. Mary's talking to this angel. Well, you know, he's doing most of the talking. And she's kind of freaked out doesn't know what he's talking about. She questions the possibility of his prediction. The angel assures her that it's going to happen, and she responds in the best way possible. She says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May your word, Rima, to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I am the Lord's servant. May what you say come true. I'm willing to be used. If nothing else, Mary should at least be held up as an example of someone yielded to the Spirit of God. So indeed, she becomes pregnant nine months later. She, we get the Christmas story with the angels and the shepherds and the wise men, though the, she, the wise men really didn't show up to like two years later, but that's a sermon for another time. And her son grows up to be the savior of the world, just as the angel had said. It's an amazing story, and it's understandable why Mary would be put on a pedestal, but from reading the story, it's obvious she really is just an ordinary girl. She's young, a woman who you know, pretty much is ignored in life. She was surprised that this angel was talking to you. I mean, if she was truly a sinless person, do you think she would have doubted what God said? Not likely. And so uh, she wasn't perfect. And if she really was the queen of heaven, don't you think Jesus would have lifted her up on earth and made her something greater than she was? But the fact is, is that she really indeed was an ordinary person, an ordinary girl, just like you and me. And the question is, why does this even matter? Why, are you just here to bash the Catholic Church? Are you here to just like refute the doctrine? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that the reason why this matters, because if Mary was anything but an ordinary person, if she really was sinless, if she really was a perpetual virgin and the, and the queen mother and such, if it took all of that for her to be able to birth the Son of God, what hope do you and I have of getting close to him? If it took all of that, all of that extreme specialness, that uniqueness, she's practically another Jesus in a female form, if it took all of that to have that kind of relationship, that kind of closeness with Jesus, what hope do we have of having that? But the very fact that she was so ordinary, so humble, so plain, that it gives you and I hope that perhaps the same thing that happened to her can happen to you and me. Now, I'm not saying that we should all give physical birth to Jesus, but wouldn't it be cool to have an angel come and say to you, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But the thing is, is that you have had that. 
God talks to you through his word. And there's places all over the place that say, I love you, I care about you. I'll read a few of them here. Psalm 139, for you, this is David talking to God. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Talk about special attention. Formed in your mother's womb. Every hair of your head numbered. Is that not highly favored? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Is that not favor? Is he just talking to the sinless people like Mary? Or is he talking to you and me? Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And he will never leave you. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So just like Mary, God knows you. And he loves you. And he favors you. And he's with you. And just like Mary got to physically conceive Jesus inside of her, we too in a sense, get to conceive Jesus in a spiritual way. Follow me on this. You see, when a person accepts the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus, there's a very real sense that Jesus, or the Spirit of Jesus, moves in. And now we have Jesus inside of us. In Galatians, Paul says that Christ lives in me. In Romans, Paul refers to the Spirit of Christ inside of the believer. Jesus often referred to being in us. So it's really not that much of a stretch to think of Jesus as being conceived inside of the person who believes. And then for Mary, as the baby grew inside of her, just as any pregnant woman would experience, there was a noticeable change. There were significant organs being moved around, and eventually you start to notice that someone else is inside of there. You know, with a pregnant woman, you feel the baby move and that kind of thing. But likewise, when Christ moves in and things, when Christ moves into your heart, into your spirit, things start to change. First Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is coming. As Christ begins to grow inside of you, uh, meaning that as you feed on God's word and his spirit starts taking shape inside of you, you can't help but notice a difference. You start to feel things that you never felt before. You start to see the world in a different light. You st- it's almost like there's... Someone else inside of you, guiding you, correcting you, encouraging you. Romans 8, 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, what the flesh desires. But those who live accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And for Mary, and as for any other mother, there's really a point in time when you can't hide it anymore. You start growing. You start getting bigger. And, and you know, Mary went and hung out with her cousin for about three months until she started showing. And then you know, she wasn't married yet, and you know, Joseph almost divorced her. So you can't hide it after a while when you, when you have a baby inside of you. And just likewise, when you have Christ inside of you, there comes a point in time when you can't hide it anymore. He's changed so much on the inside. You see the world in such a different way that you can't help but be different. And people notice. And so just like Mary, we get to experience, in a sense, a similar thing. Not in a a physical way, but in a spiritual way. And not because we're special. Not because we're already sinless or because we're going to be the the queen of heaven or, or anything like that someday. Simply because God loves us. Just as he loves Mary. She was an ordinary girl with an extraordinary God. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16, the famous... For God so loved the world, not just Mary, that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Like I said, she was an ordinary girl with an extraordinary God. And you and I have the same opportunity, the same choice that Mary had when she was faced with the question of, will you let him move in or not? Will you allow him to rock your world and change you from the inside to the point you can't hide it anymore. I like to personalize this verse. It's uh, John 3, 16. For God so loved you. You. 
You can read it, God so loved me, individually, uniquely, just me. God so loved you that he gave up his only son so that if you will believe in him, you will not have to perish, will not have to spend eternity away from this God who loves you, but you will have eternal life. Her response was yes. I am the Lord's servant. May what you say come true in me, and you and I have the same option as well. It's as if God is saying to you, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And if you will allow me, I will cause the Holy Spirit to overshadow you and cause great change in your life. I will cause my son who died for you and rose again to place his spirit inside of you so that you can experience the oneness with me that I created you for. He knows you by name. He comes to you and says, You're highly favored. I know the number of hairs on your head. I formed you uniquely in your mother's womb. Before that even started, I knew all the days of your life. I know you. You're highly favored. You're special to me. I love you. Will you allow me to change you? To bring you the kind of life you were meant to have? And so the fact that Mary was not what all of the myths say is good news. <laughs> it's good news for us. Because if it took all of that to get that close to Jesus, what hope would we have? But the fact is, she was an ordinary girl with an extraordinary God, and you're an ordinary person, and I'm an ordinary person with an extraordinary God who reaches his hand out and says, you're highly favored. Take my hand. Let me do a work in your life. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, we love you this morning, and I thank you for this message and for uh, the story of Mary, and I thank you that she was indeed just an ordinary, regular person, just like the rest of us. But the, the fact is, you look at us and you don't see ordinary. You, you, you don't make junk, as the bumper sticker says, and you, you made each of us so uniquely, so individually, so on purpose you have plans for us, plans for prospering. And, but you set it up so that we have a choice. We get to choose whether to let you do that for us or not. And so this morning for you in the crowd, if, you're, if you've never, maybe you've heard this before, maybe you've read the John 3.16 before, but, and you've heard that Jesus loves you, and you've heard, yeah, if I could just, you know, believe in him, I'd get to go to heaven. If you've heard all that before, but maybe it's just never sunk in. And maybe, maybe it did today. Maybe the idea of Mary being an ordinary girl kind of spoke to you. If, if, but if you feel in your heart, do you know what? Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time that I allow this God who keeps telling me over and over and over again just how much he loves me and cares for me and favors me. Maybe it's time I say yes to him. Maybe it's time I do like Mary said and just say, you know, do what you will, Lord. And so if you're in that position in your life today and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, I, I want to lead you in a little prayer. Now, the prayer itself, just saying the words, doesn't, doesn't do anything. You have to, in your heart, simply tell Jesus that, yes, I will accept your forgiveness. I'll stop trying to do it myself. And then after the service, you can come talk to me or... Uh, and we can discuss you know, what, what this means for your life. But for now, why don't you say this little prayer with me and mean it with your whole heart. Say, uh, Dear Jesus, I know that I am not a perfect person. Just like Mary, I'm ordinary. And I know that you died for my sins, but you rose from the dead, and I believe that. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I want to accept that forgiveness. Please give me your grace. I know I can't earn it. 